If you've spent any amount of time exploring brass pedagogy, you may have noticed that what one person recommends, another may recommend against. Now, that's true for mouthpiece buzzing, although I do think that the consensus overall tends to be more positive than negative. In any case, three teachers who come to mind as strongly in favor of mouthpiece buzzing are James Stamp, Jim Thompson, and Jimmy Maxwell. So I guess maybe we could say that mouthpiece buzzing is a good idea if your name is Jim. Or Chase, I guess. If you're just joining us, this is the fourth in a series of videos relating to the Brass Tactics 660 routine. You can find the previous episodes and subsequent ones in a playlist, and you might do well to start at the beginning of the series. Let me start by addressing the term buzzing. If you're buzzing your lips alone, that's a pretty accurate description of the sound. Free lip buzzing requires quite a bit of embouchure compression, especially because you don't have a rim to isolate the vibrating points. As you connect various bits of tubing to your lips, you actually have to release some of that embouchure compression to get the most resonant sound. If you try to play the horn or even the mouthpiece with the same amount of compression that it takes to buzz your lips alone, the sound is going to be very choked or tight. Your lips do vibrate when you play the mouthpiece, but they don't really buzz. And I think that could give people the wrong impression about how much embouchure compression is actually needed. But the term buzzing is generally accepted, so I'm not going to swim against the tide. To me, the principal benefits of mouthpiece buzzing relate to tone quality and pitch accuracy. If there are flaws in the lip vibration, you'll hear it on the mouthpiece. If you approach this exercise with a critical ear, it can be pretty frustrating or even disheartening to hear your flaws revealed so clearly. But the quickest and the surest path to improvement is to reveal your flaws so that you can take steps to address them. Pitch accuracy comes with the fact that the mouthpiece has no mechanical means like valves or a slide to delineate one note from another. We're very much like vocalists in this situation in that the only way to produce a given pitch is to hear it first. As the mouthpiece routine moves up in half steps, unless you have perfect pitch, you'll probably need some kind of reference or starting pitch to stay on track. I use drones that I made up for my tuning tactics book, and they consist of a pure tuned root, fifth, and root above. Generally, I listen to the drone first, and I match my upper and lower pitches to it. Then I turn off the drone while I play the line in the exercise. When I finish, I turn the drone on again to see whether my pitch has drifted. That makes this an ear training exercise as well, and it helps to connect the physical sensation of playing a note with the sound of it. The buzzing exercise, as it appears in the 660 routine, consists of descending major scales, followed by an ascending gliss from the bottom note back up to the top. Depending on the level, the scales and the glisses can be one or two octaves. The exercise ascends in half steps, as high as you can comfortably buzz. Typically, that'll be somewhat lower than you can play on the horn, but it likely represents the range that you solidly own on the horn. I'm going to demonstrate in three keys, which will have me covering an overall range of two and a half octaves. Here are a few things to note as you watch the demonstration. I use the separate lead pipe for this exercise that I used in the lead pipe exercise, but with a buzz aid inserted. The buzz aid diverts air out the side of it rather than into the pipe, so that it essentially turns the horn, or in this case the lead pipe, into a holder for the mouthpiece. That helps keep you in a more normal playing position. While I strive to be reasonably accurate with the pitch, my main priority is that the top note should feel the same whether I start on it or end on it. I play this exercise on the CS66M mouthpiece, which is the largest of my three cups. That makes it harder in the upper register, which forces me to pay close attention to the balance of lip and air compression.
The Brass Tactics 660 routine will continue in the next episode in this series, and you'll either see that one overhead or another video that YouTube thinks you'll like.